Hi class. Today we're going to talk about pH and buffers. First we need to have a little bit of a recap about hydrogen. Let's look at a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen is element number one, so it just has one proton here in its nucleus. It also has a mass of one, which tells us that it has no neutrons. It does have one electron in its first energy level to sort of cancel out that. All right, so this is a neutral hydrogen atom, one of each. But we know that atoms don't like to exist like this. They like to have full valence shells. So this one electron in this shell does not make hydrogen stable. So what it wants to do is get rid of that electron. When that electron leaves, what we have left over is a hydrogen ion. Because the negative electron left and all that's left is one proton, the hydrogen has a positive charge. This is a hydrogen ion, but it is also simply just a proton. Those words are used interchangeably, so be aware of that as we move forward. All right, so we're going to talk about the dissociation of water. Here are two different pictures of dis the dissociation of water. We have two water molecules shown here. Remember that water molecules are held together inside by polar covalent bonds here and here, which makes the water molecule have a slightly negative oxygen end and a slightly positive hydrogen end. These are poles, polar. The slightly negative oxygen and the slightly positive hydrogens are attracted to each other. That is a hydrogen bond. Remember that? That hydrogen bond is holding these water molecules to one another. Occasionally what can happen is that the hydrogen from one of the water molecules is going to move over and become part of the other water molecule. That's what's happening on the other side of the arrow here. This thing is called a hydronium ion. It has an extra hydrogen, so it's H3O, and it now has a positive charge. The hydrogen took its one proton in here, but it left its electron behind. When it leaves its electron behind, that leaves a negatively charged hydroxide ion as our other product. Sometimes the hydrogen ion is attached to a water, and that's called hydronium. If the hydrogen ion is just by itself, like in this bottom diagram, then we just call it a hydrogen ion or remember a proton. So here's another picture, here's the water. If that last sort of ear breaks off, the hydroxide ion here is negatively charged and we have a positively charged hydrogen there. This is pure water breaking apart into hydroxide ions and hydrogen ions or hydronium. Hydrogen ions and hydronium ions are kind of used interchangeably. They have the same basic effects on the cell or the solution surrounding them. Here are a couple more representations of the dissociation of water. We have the words, we have the formulas, we have the space filling model, we have the Lewis dot structure. Each time though, the same thing is basically happening. The hydrogen ion or the proton is leaving. What's left behind is the hydroxide ion that now has a negative charge. That electron that used to belong to hydrogen is now in the hydroxide. The bottom part here is telling you a reminder that sometimes that hydrogen, at least usually typically, that hydrogen attaches onto another water to make that hydronium ion that has a positive charge because of its extra proton. If this were just in a glass of water or something, the pH of that solution would still be neutral. pH is a measurement of the comparison of how much hydrogen there is compared to how much hydroxide ion there is. When those numbers are equal, we call that neutral, and that is seven on the pH scale. So let's talk about when it's not seven on the pH scale. When it's not seven, we're gonna get something that is either acidic or basic. So let's talk about acids first. Acids are substances that donate hydrogen ions to the solution. There are several different ways to define an acid. We are using what is called the Bronsted-Lowry definition. I think that's the one that's most used for, for biology. So that's the one we're going to address here. And so, donate hydrogen ion here is the important thing. That is the role of an acid, also called a proton donor, because a proton and a hydrogen ion are the same thing. Here's a couple examples we'll talk about. And then if you're looking at the pH scale, solutions that are acidic are given values between one and six, approximately on the pH scale. This cute little guy, this is an acid. You see this right here, there's a plus sign on there. That is a hydrogen ion and he is giving it away. So he is donating hydrogen ions. That's the definition of an acid. Here's a generic example. Here's the hydrogens. 
all acids have hydrogens in them. So they start with that attached to something else. That blue A is something else, some negatively charged particle. When they break apart or dissociate, you get the proton, that's the definition of an acid, and then you have the other thing left over that got rid of a proton, which means it could take a proton back in. This is called the conjugate ba base. We'll come back to that in a minute. Up top here is an equation of this actually occurring. We could take the white solid HCl and dissolve it in water. If we did that, what would happen is you attach onto the water and we're gonna get a hydronium and the chlorine is gonna be by itself. This chlorine is the conjugate base and the proton is now attached to the water making hydronium. You can see HCl, you just saw that, and H2SO4. This is sulfuric acid. It has two hydrogens that it could potentially give up. All right, so anything that can donate a hydrogen is considered to be an acid. Let's switch to bases. A base is the opposite. They absorb hydrogen ions, All right? So here's our little base guy. This is the hydrogen ion, and he is taking it in. So that's going in there. Anything that can absorb hydrogen ions from a solution is going to be considered a base. It's throwing off the balance between the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions by absorbing hydrogen ions. Um, a little note here in parentheses, bases can release hydroxide ions, but they don't always do that. All right, I'll give you a couple examples in a minute. So base, proton acceptor, sodium hydroxide, and ammonia are two bases. And on the pH scale, you'll find them having values from 8 to 14. Here's the example of ammonia over here. There's the molecule here is a hydrogen ion hanging around. The ammonia can actually absorb that. That's the definition of a base. So now we have ammonium ion. It has an NH4 with a positive charge. This thing acted as a base. Acting as a base means that you absorb hydrogens and it did that just now. This molecule is now the conjugate acid. Right. Either way it goes, if it can go back and forth between an acid and a base, whichever thing it just did is considered to be the conjugate. Again, I will look at some more examples of that because that can get a little bit confusing. All right. Here's the actual pH scale um, with some examples. Over here, we have the acids at the top. Those acids are going from one to six again. These things are all acidic, which means that they have more hydrogen ion then they have hydroxide ion. All right. At seven, the amounts are equal. That's what this says right here, that's neutral. The diagram is showing being acidic and here each of these alone, those are hydrogen ions. And you see there are more hydrogen ions in here than there are hydroxide ions. Definition of an acidic solution. At the bottom, let's look at the base, a base is going to be somewhere between eight and 14. These ones have more hydroxide ion present in the solutions, and you can see that here. There's only a couple hydrogen ions there. These things are called basic or alkaline. Over to the side, a couple pictures. Pure water, when it's broken apart, there's equal numbers of these things, so this would be neutral. In this one, if you put HCl into a solution and it dissociates, you're getting more hydrogen ions, so that makes this an acid. This one, if you break these apart, you're getting hydroxide ion, and if you have more hydroxide ion around that can take in a hydrogen and make water, then this thing is a base. All right, so anything that skews it toward having less H plus and more OH minus is a base, and anything that goes the opposite direction, increasing the H plus, is an acid. This one gets a little bit more complicated. This is showing a little bit of the mathematical basis for pH. We're not gonna do too much of this. Um, that's beyond the scope of this course. So this middle thing in the middle is just showing the comparison between H plus and OH minus. We're looking at the combination of the two things. So over here on the very low end of the pH scale, so up here, they're showing it as zero. This is a solution that has all hydrogen ion and no hydroxide down here. The other end of the scale has all hydroxide and no hydrogen ion. All right, so that's the other end of the scale, a pH of 14 up here. 
And then there's all the in-betweens, where there's varying amounts of H plus and OH minus in comparison to each other. That's the whole idea of the pH scale. The numbers at the top, we're just looking at a few. And then the other numbers here are different than what we've seen before. So we're going to look at this that is in parentheses. So this is a kind of a different um, thing than we've seen so far. This in parentheses makes their brackets, makes this mean the concentration of hydrogen ion. That's what the brackets means. And this is the concentration of hydroxide ion. It's a comparison of the two things. We're not actually looking at how many H pluses there are. There are astronomical numbers, moles and moles of them, right? So we're not actually looking at the number of them. We're looking at the relative concentration of the two things. There are two equations that are important here, and we're going to talk about these two equations. Don't let them overwhelm you. It's, they're not that difficult. And I have summarized them down here at the bottom in these two bullets. All right, so let's look at the top one. It says this means that the concentration superscripts are always adding up to negative 14. So if you take the concentration of hydrogen ion, so that's this equation is the one we're talking about right now. Take the concentration of hydrogen ion and the concentration of hydroxide ion and put them together. What we're getting is that the superscript value, the exponent, is always going to be equal to negative 14. So for example, if we have up here, the hydrogen ion concentration is 10 to the negative 10th. If you know that when they're together, they add up to negative 14, you would know that the hydroxide ion concentration has to be negative four. Those two values are always gonna equal that negative 14 as the superscript. So if you know one, you can calculate the other. The other equation here, the pH is equal to the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. That one is talking about how you actually tell the pH number on the scale. So it says the hydrogen ion subscript's absolute value is the pH. So you look at the hydrogen, it's pH, right? It's parts hydrogen or potential for hydrogen. So that is the concentration that we wanna focus on. So up here, if you take the absolute value of the superscript, that is the pH. So you ignore the negative sign basically. Four is the pH. If the concentration is 10 to the negative seven, seven, is the pH. You don't use the hydroxide ion concentration, you use the hydrogen ion concentration. You could calculate it because you know these two rules, but it's the hydrogen ion concentration that you use directly. All right, so don't get too confused by those. Let's look at another one. So let's look at another pH scale. This one is more detailed. It is showing all of the values. So let's look at the pH of seven here. If the pH is seven, that tells you the hydrogen ion concentration must be 10 to the negative seventh. We learned that on the last slide. Also up here, let me say this real quick. They're calling it hydronium ion concentration. It's the same thing as hydrogen ion concentration, so don't let that confuse you. We also know that the subscript, superscripts, superscripts, are always adding up to 10 to the negative 14th. So if you know one, you know the other one. And you can see all the way down that that is how they are. Negative 13, negative one, negative 12, negative two. They're always adding up to negative 14. But the pH value itself comes from the hydrogen ion concentration. These are exponential values. So if we go from a pH of eight to a pH of nine, we're not saying that it is, has one more hydroxide ion or one less hydrogen ion. We're saying 10 times more basic as you go up this scale, or 10 times more acidic as you go down for each number. These are big changes. All right, so what I want you to do now is pause the video and see if you can go through and answer all of these questions. And if there is something that you're unsure of, go back and rewatch a little bit and see if you can do those things as of now. All right, so the question is, why does pH matter? Why are we even talking about this? It's really important in biology. There's a lot of words on this slide, but just bear with me. So molecules in the body, especially proteins, only function when they're the right shape. Molecular shape we learned about last chapter is really, really important. So that molecular shape is what is going to lead pH to being so important. It says molecules get their shapes from the interaction of their charged and uncharged parts with charged particles like hydrogen ion in their environment. 
so positives and negatives are attracting we talked about bonding already negatives are repelling one another positives are repelling one another so their shape is very much based on the charges of what's going on around them so if we mess with that if we change the number of charged particles the number of positives or negatives are surrounding chemical reactions or other molecules that is going to dramatically impact the cell's behavior so it says if the amount of charged particles in the environment changes as pH changes then the structures of the molecules are changed and they can no longer function properly I know that's a lot and I don't usually put that many words on a slide but I really want you to understand that that's why we're talking about pH here this is what's important is that it is affecting molecular structure and chemical reactions and that is what runs the entire body so here are some examples of that this is showing some proteins and what they look like under normal circumstances all right so here's one um, normal body pH blood pH about seven different parts of the body have different pHs and the blood has a pH about seven so if this is a protein that exists in the blood this would be its normal structure but if something happens in the body and all of a sudden the pH of the blood goes down to three all kinds of extra positively charged hydrogen ions hanging around that's going to get in the way of all of these bonds and attractions that were holding it in its right shape and that thing is going to become denatured denatured means to take it out of its natural shape and make it different all right so basically it unravels or uncoils these other pictures are showing the same thing here is the protein and what it's supposed to be looking like if all of a sudden the pH is adjusted to be extra low it uncoils and you get this weirdly shaped thing that can no longer do its job this is a little closer up showing an interaction actually right here in this bottom picture showing an interaction that then gets broken this is if you add a bunch of extra hydrogens it interferes with the bonding there so it's pretty important to keep your pH just right luckily evolution has brought us buffers buffers are molecules or chemicals that will keep the pH at a given or needed level that number is not always seven sometimes people think oh buffers keep the pH at seven that is not necessarily the case different parts of the body need to be different pHs your stomach has to be about a pH of two so buffers keep it at a needed level whatever that level is all right I don't want you to have the wrong idea there so how can buffers possibly do this they can do this as acting as acids or as base under different circumstances these molecules can be both depending on what's going on in their chemical environment so they're going to be made of a weak acid and its conjugate base all right so let's look at an example to get that clarified so here in the bottom picture this is just the dot structures these are the space filling models sort of so look at what is going on here this is acetic acid it is a weak acid in its weakest versions it's vinegar all right so a weak acid means that it can give away its hydrogen which it's doing right here that's the definition of an acid is it's releasing hydrogen and you see it doing that the thing that makes it a weak acid is that it can also take back its hydrogen if you're a strong acid you're giving away your hydrogens forever and you're never taking them back but a weak acid is useful as a buffer because it's like mm, 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 sure I'll give and take both ways all right so the acetic acid is acting as an acid it's giving away a hydrogen this thing that accepts a hydrogen is called a base that's the definition of a base in this case it's water water is accepting a hydrogen we know this already when water accepts a hydrogen ion it becomes hydronium these two right here are both hydronium ion it's an H3O with a positive charge this H3O is the conjugate acid of water which just means it was a base and it took in an extra hydrogen there it is right there and now it's an acid because it can give that away again so they go back and forth that's what the conjugates do they transfer back and forth as the hydrogens move in between them so in this case acetic acid and then the um, conjugate base is over here showing that it can now take the hydrogen back so the hydrogens go from one molecule to the other that's what allows them to act as a buffer if there's too many H's they absorb them 
if there's too few H's or H pluses, they give them back off. That's what a buffer does. Here are some examples of conjugate acids and bases. So anything that acts in is an acid. All right, so this side, this side is all the acids. By definition, they give up hydrogen ions. The other side are after they've given away their H's, what's left over? That thing is called, here it is, the conjugate base. These things are able to absorb a hydrogen ion or act as a base. So what happens each time, you can see, is that the hydrogen leaves and there's a negative particle left behind. So if you have these pairs present in a solution, no matter what happens with pH, it's going to remain stable or whatever happens with the hydrogen ion levels and hydroxide ions levels, these molecules will respond and maintain the pH at the needed level. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. They're all over in your body and they can actually act as buffers. And that is because at one end they have an acid and at one end they have a base. So that allows them to be able to do both on opposite ends of their structure. This one here, what happened was it gave this one away and now it has acted as an acid. This side has a place to absorb a hydrogen ion and once it's done that right there, it has acted as a base. So amino acids and therefore proteins are good buffers for our bodies. Buffers are great, but they don't work forever, All right? That's what this says here. Even in a buffer, eventually you will run out of molecules to absorb or release hydrogen ions, and the pH will eventually change. This is what is called the buffering capacity. So this is kind of a vague graph down here, but what it's showing is that if the solution has a pH of around two, all right, so this is the pH over here, and we are adding drops, this is drops, drops of base that are being added on. The buffer for right now is taking care of that. It's releasing a whole bunch of extra hydrogens and it's maintaining the pH at the needed level. Eventually though, it won't be able to release any more hydrogens. It'll basically run out. Once the buffer runs out of extra hydrogens, the pH will all of a sudden change. So even though we are lucky to have those buffers in our body, they can't do it forever. So our pHs can get out of whack and we can have serious problems from that. So what happens if you take an acid and a base and put them together? That reaction is called a neutralization. I feel like this makes sense. If you take something acidic and something basic and you put them together, they're going to counteract each other and we're gonna get something that is now neutral. The reaction is called neutralization. Here are some examples. Here's one over here as well. I'm not gonna say they destroy each other, but if you add them together, an acid, say this has a pH of four, and this one has a pH of 10, put them together, what you actually get is salt water, which doesn't have any pH at all because it doesn't have any of those um, extra hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions running around. You get salt water that's going to be then neutral. Supposedly you could drink that that's a little scary to me. Here's another examples. Ammonium hydroxide, phosphoric acid, put them together. We get two other chemicals dissolved in water, but their pHs are going to be neutral, hence neutralization. This is another reason that pH is important to living things and it's called acidification and it's happening in our oceans currently. When we burn our fossil fuels, we release a lot of carbon dioxide into the air. When that carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, it creates carbonic acid. Carbonic acid has an increase in hydrogen ions, there's the pH, but that also decreases the amount of carbonate ion that is present, and carbonate ion is used by all kinds of ocean creatures to make their shells. So it's impacting coral reefs and all kinds of other organisms that use that carbonate ion. It's important to understand how pH works because it's impacting all different areas of biology.